Can you hear me? Can you? Am I? Can you hear us? Oh, that did something. Yes, you needed closer to your mic. I wonder if I have it on wrong because it goes out. Hello, can you hear me? Anything happening there? I'll tell, ooh, you can hear me now, because I can hear me now. Now I can't say any, any secrets. All right, I just, I can't seem to get it over here, if you don't mind. Is that good? Thank you. So nice. Well, okay, I'm just going to wait until they say we're beginning so you can keep chatting. Thank you for coming. I see other familiar faces I can't put names to. That bothers me. I know this man right here. Yes, hello, my mic is on. Turn the mic on, that helps. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christine Radarski. I'm one of the editors of Rochester History Journal and also the manager in our local history and genealogy division here in the library. And I'm delighted to have you all with us for our first Rochester History Journal author spotlight with Lisa Clemen. Lisa has been a friend of the local history and genealogy division since she first set foot in <laughs> Rochester, I think. And I know many of you also know her personally. Uh, she's someone who immediately immersed herself in our city and its history when she arrived. So we're delighted to welcome an old friend back to talk about the research that she's been doing here in the community and in this library for many years now. Lisa uh, retired from teaching English at Assumption College and Worcester State University in Massachusetts in 2013. And that's when she moved to Rochester to research and write about her ancestors, who we're going to hear about today, the musical Dosenbox. She has conducted researcher, research at the archives of the George Eastman House, here at the Rochester Public Library, the Sibley Library, and many, many other places. In 2014, Clemens spent one year at the George Eastman Re 
Museum reading all of Eastman's letters. And she also served as the program director of the Eastman Museum Council for two years. So again, she's got deep connections and we're eager to allow her to share the work that she has published in the most recent issue of the Rochester History Journal. Wonderful article. We are delighted to be able to bring you this journal in a new format as a result of our partnership with RIT Press and the RIT Department of History. And if you haven't already gotten a copy or if you're not a subscriber, make sure you step to the back of the room before you leave and see our friends from RIT Press to get yourself a copy. And so with that, I'm delighted to welcome you all in this room and also we have many people streaming at home. So. Thank you for joining us today. I welcome okay. Lisa. All right. Hello, everybody. Let's get that out of the way. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to see you here. I'm so happy to see familiar faces whose names I remember and familiar faces whose names I can't pull out of my head right now. So <laughs> make sure to say hi to me afterwards. Um, I first want to do a few thank yous, and the first thank you is to Christine Radarsky for encouraging me, not just in this article, but in all the work that I do, always supporting, always, and the local history division. Um, what a treasure. Then I want to thank Emily Morey, who's behind that window back there, who was my editor in this. It was, um, I submitted this two years ago, and it was two years of what I call a rigorous editing process. <laughs> And by that, I'm complimented. It made the article better and better and stronger and stronger. So thank you for um, Emily. Thank you to RIT Press for doing this and to the chair of the history department, Tamar Carroll. Um, and there's many more thank yous I can do because I've been supported in my research from people all over this wonderful city, a city filled with people who enjoy their local history, and I've never really quite seen anything like it anywhere else. Not that I'm that well-traveled, but Rochester is wonderful. All right, I'm gonna get right into it because it might be too long and I might have to move ahead. Um, when I first moved to Rochester in 2013 to research and eventually write about the Dosen Box, in my mind, this was a family history, which would also be interesting to others because I had the golden ticket George Eastman was part of the Dosenbach story. In fact, the Dosenbach Rochester Orchestra, Herman's Orchestra, and the Rochester Park Band, Theodore's, Herman and Theodore, you'll learn, were two brothers, Theodore's my great-grandfather. They played for decades all over Rochester and surrounding towns for all kinds of events, large and small, personal and formal. I didn't know when I started out that I would collect this much information as I've gotten, and there's no end to it. We live in the great age of digitizing. It's wonderful. Um, but I've got documentation on thousands and thousands of events that the Dosenbachs played for in their different entities. I can almost chart their days. So back in those days, and by that I mean the turn of the, the couple decades before and after the turn of the 20th century, music was everywhere. And by music, I mean live music. All meetings, all gatherings had music. And as the events began to accumulate, as I was finding them in newspapers largely, but also elsewhere, I, could see, I began to see something. And so it was that within the first year, I realized that this was not just my family's story. It was the story of a city and a time period. It was, in fact, a history of the city of Rochester as seen through the experiences of the Dosenbachs. And I say this to you, and you, wherever you are out there, watching on a screen somewhere, I say this to you because it is the same with your families. Your archives, your family stuff, up there in the attic, down there in the cellar, out there in the storage facility, those are actually all important historical archives, important to us as well as to you. Researching, whoop, something happened. Researching, whoop. I can really talk without a microphone, by the way, but I guess I, is it on? Because I can't, ah, okay, good, thank you. Researching family history and attempting to understand the story of that history is what I'm calling a bottoms up way of seeing larger, it seems to me like it's going in and out, but if it's good for you, I'll just keep going, okay. 
Anyways, researching family history and attempting to understand the story, so we got facts and then we've got stories, um, is what I call, for me, a bottoms-up way of seeing larger histories. I don't mean getting drunk while you're doing it. <laughs> uh, it's a bottoms-up way of seeing larger histories, rather than beginning with generalizations about what we know about that time period or place, it in fact begins with the tiniest details. And since DNA has become such an important part of family history searching, I do mean tiny. We begin with the minute details and then we work our way up to find the story. And as we gather information, details come from very different places and very different people because our ancestors didn't stand still. And those details begin to work together to help me or you to perhaps understand what's going on. So for example, oh God, I just love it. I love when the technology works. For example, there is an image in the George Eastman Museum archives, and I'm talking about this one right here. That's Herman, and that's Theodore. That's probably Mrs. Mulligan. And look at their faces. Somebody has told some kind of a body joke. <laughs> They're all laughing, and Theodore seems downright embarrassed. Um, there is this image there, um, and the image is of uh, the Dosen box at George Eastman's North Carolina retreat called Oak Lodge. George Eastman brought his musicians there a couple of different years so that he and his guests, his invited guests, could have music in this very special place. But this photo shows Herman and Theodore with what looks like a kind of a plow as if they're working, and everybody is laughing at some kind of body joke, as I said. I spent a couple or a few years wondering about this photo. Annabelle, hi Annabelle. Um, what the heck are they doing? Are they plowing? I'd been through Mr. Eastman's letters with no enlightenment on the matter, so I didn't expect to find the answer. Some things we'll never know. And then a few years later, I was fortunate to listen to a recorded interview which Vincent Lenti, historian and retired professor of piano at the Eastman School of Music, conducted with Hazel Dosenbach, Herman's daughter. He did this in 1980 when Vince was writing about the Dosenbachs. In that interview, Hazel told a funny story. She said that she remembered her father talking about how the musicians, when they were at George Eastman's North Carolina retreat, and when they weren't performing, they were kind of bored. And so they built themselves a tennis court. Ha! That's got to be what they're doing right there, because I really don't think they're plowing a field for farming. So to me, we've got a nice little explanation for this photograph, although building a tennis court, that just raises all kinds of new questions, doesn't it, is all it does. And it's just, it's an example of the way these materials come from all these different places and then work together to um, help you see your story. And that's why it's really helpful to do exhaustive research, if you can, if you have time on your subjects, and that's what I have done and will continue to do. And then there are those, I'm describing, um, I'm, I'm not exactly going to summarize their year in Europe because you know why? I'm going to point my laser pointer in the back <laughs> because it's right there in the article, but I will get to that. I'm going to talk a lot about the nature of doing research because I think you're all here because a lot of us do it. Hi, Annabelle. Um, so there are those ta-da moments that you have when you're researching and, and many of you know about these. Um, like that day, in the U of R's rare books and special collections and preservation department, when I was reading letters kept in the Herman Dosenbach papers, and in the springtime of 1911, friends were expressing great concern about Herman's wife, Daisy. Actually, I'm gonna, there you go, that's Hazel. Anyways, I should have gone there first. Um, about Daisy, who was seriously ill, gravely ill, um, but the specific illness was not mentioned, so I was left to wonder about that. But if you keep going through the letters, and if you take them home and put them in chronological order, you realize that in December of 1911, when the Dosenbachs were in Berlin, their good friend Montgomery Leach wrote to them, giving details of his recent terrible health, illness, and surgeries, and his three-week stay in Dr. Lee's private hospital on Lake Ave with Dr. Lee himself taking care of him. Montgomery, well, Herman called him Monty, 
and so I shall too, because I'm in the family, Monty had had a ruptured appendix, and in that letter, he mentions that Daisy went through the same thing, and now he knows how she feels. So, ta-da! I know what happened to Daisy, and I understand better when Daisy is ill, as she gets a couple of times over this year in Europe. These are the things we want to know when we do um, family research. And by the way, in terms of researching this year, many friends wrote letters to the Dosenbachs out in Europe, and one of them was Montgomery Leach. And when you take the letter and then sort of go backwards and say, well, who was that person? Now you're into Rochester history, and it all reflects Rochester history. Montgomery Leach had forged, forged a fascinating career in public health working tirelessly for the people in Rochester, especially the poor people. He was the first superintendent of Iola Sanitarium, which had its earliest opening only a year earlier and a more formal opening just months before the Dosenbachs left for Europe. Um, there was another time, another ta-da moment, when I saw one of my central characters is Otto Dosenbach. He, there's a tragedy, there's a, a joy and success and tragedy to Otto and he has therefore become a, a favorite of mine. And there was a time in the rare books room when I saw little Otto Dosenbach's image for the first time. I've been researching here for six, seven years. Um, I thought I'd seen everything. Um, and then I found a different file with Dosenbach family photos and I pulled that out and oh, here's Otto. This is my Otto. And, um, he was known as Rochester's wonderful boy violinist in the 1870s and 1880s. He was Herman's older brother. He was really successful and eventually performed with Dr. Leopold Damrosch's New York Symphony Society and the German Opera Company in New York City. His career was cut short before he was 30 years old by, well, illness, as we like to say, and that's another story. That's a ta-da moment. You see it. <laughs> You're in the silent reading room and you want to tell somebody like, hey, look what I've got, look what I've got. And one more, before I moved to Rochester and I was getting into learning about the Dosenbachs because there were more things that had been put online, I was in bed late at night with my laptop. So maybe this is like 2012, you know, in bed, comforter, laptop up by the knees doing research. And I discovered something. Otto got married in New York City in 1885. Now you might not at this point know the significance of that, but you think of when you learn things about your family relatives that are shocking. I just sat up like this and to no one in the dark except for the, 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 the blue screen from the laptop, I'm like, Otto got married, Otto got married, and you wanna tell somebody. And the people you wanna tell are the family. I don't think they knew about Otto's marriage. I wanna tell Herman and Theodore. That's the way it is, doing family research, and I hope I've, um, gotten to many of you who have had these same experiences and maybe not thought about it. So um, another thing in regards to experience. I didn't have to move to Rochester in order to do my research. I could have visited, and there's the internet. But I moved to Rochester in 2013. I retired from teaching English, and I moved to Rochester because I wanted to do more than collect the facts and the anecdotes and all that. I wanted to get a sense of their, the Dosenbach's experience. I wanted to walk where they walked. I wanted to see what they saw. This led me to having to get a clearer understanding of architecture because as I walked around places, I had to try to blot out from my sight what had come there since the Dosenbach's and only see what was there when they were there. I might have walked into a few trees as a result of that. <laughs> You're not laughing at my jokes. Um, this emphasis that I'm saying right now on grasping experience, and experience is about seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, hearing, this has carried into my ideas on how I want to write about the Dosenbox. I want to write experiential history. I just made that up. I want the Dosenbox to come alive, not physically, of course, but for the reader to jump off the page and into readers' imaginations. I want to write pieces that are, well, crammed with historical details and understanding, but which make the people vivid and real and make the story a bit of a page turner. Of course, 
I did not come to Rochester as a formally or academically trained historian. I was an English professor. I was a storyteller with an emphasis on autobiography, memoir, um, and fictional first-person narratives, that kind of thing. Many family historians, in attempting to get the story, will wonder about their ancestors. And the basic question we all want to know is, even after we've gotten the events and the dates and the relationships and the addresses and all that stuff we go after, what we really want to know is, what were they like? What were they like? How did they think? Were they serious, funny, intense, scared? What were they like? And that, that's what we English professors call characterizations. That is the hardest thing to get, the most difficult part of family history, to feel like you know who this person was, who they might have been if you passed them on the street. Would you turn and walk to the other side or walk up and shake hands and say hello? I found that people from the past who are gone, the ones that I feel I understand the most are those who left behind some kind of first person voice, their I speaking. You can hear in those documents their voice and their tone, I'm talking about interviews, letters, diaries, recordings. And this leads me finally to the story of the Dosenbach family in Europe during 1911 and 1912. I was lucky to have materials with that first person voice telling the story. Herman's voice appears in numerous, numerous newspaper articles in which he'd been interviewed at length and which he was quoted, and also in Herman's letters to friends and business colleagues. That's him telling his story. And it turned out that there was also a diary. A diary. Do you all know if you found one. So more on that later. Um, all right, now I'm going to tell you a bit more about the Dosenbox. So that's all food for thought, as we say. The experiences of the ancestors are part of the experiences of the current day researcher and writer. I once went to a biography conference. Oh gosh, a very famous biographer whose name slips me right now really gave a whole talk about her identification with her subject and how that gets involved in the writing of it. And I, I can, um, I understand that. So, um, so this talk, as I, well, this talk as I wrote it was originally different than what I'm doing today. It was more straightforward. I, I rewrote this in the last few days. The original talk was more straightforward. It was a summary of the Dosenbox from the time in 1851. Whoop, whoop, I'm so impatient. It was the time in 18, like the time in 1851 when a man named Matthias Dosenbach emigrated to the United States from what we today call Germany. It was not unified at that time. He had one less T in his name and one less S in his name. He probably didn't say it Dosenbach, but eventually the Dosenbachs did, and from those recorded interviews and some other uh, evidence from people who knew them and are still here with us, thankfully, um, they did say it Dosenbach in their day, so that's what I do. Um, anyways, Matthias Dosenbach uh, emigrated here. He's my immigrant. He emigrated here uh, in 1851 because just two to three years earlier, in 1848 and 1849, much of the continent of Europe was in revolution. This was a huge story for me to learn about. I didn't really know this. I, I liked history in high school. I, I don't remember learning this. Maybe we did, I don't know. Basically, the entire continent was in revolution. Nowhere more so than in Matthias's homeland of Baden, which is in, and near to his little hamlet of Rheinweiler, which is in the southernmost part of what we today call Germany, separated from France by the, just the Rhine River and just above the border with Switzerland. Matthias, who will eventually become Hermann and Theodor's father, Matthias took part in some way in these Baden revolutions as his name is on a Baden police listing of revolutionists of 1849. This was not a list of honoraries <laughs> because the revolution failed. This was a dangerous list to be on. Those who took part were told to leave and were told the US wants you. Most countries would not take them as the, the, the Prussians and those in charge were putting pressure on, but the US said, we'll take them. Send them over here, we'll take them. 
So they were told to leave or spend your life in prison if you stay. And this was surely the reason why Matthias left his homeland. And my original talk would have told you about how the Dosenbach family moved to Rochester in about late 1872. And I would have told you the wonderful story of how Rochester conductor Henri Api brought the Dosenbachs to Rochester. It's such a very precious story. And if I have time at the end, remind me and I'll tell it to you. And I would have told you about how four Dosenbach brothers established themselves musically in Rochester beginning in the 1870s and continuing into about the mid-1940s. It was Otto, Adolf, Hermann, and Theodore. I told you they were German, right? <laughs> um, and I also gave a somewhat lengthy listing of many of the events where Hermann's orchestra or theater's band entertained so that you could see how their history told so much about our fair city. And also so you could see what led up to 1911 and this idea to send Herman and his family to Europe for a year. But all of that is in the article that's right over there. So I want you to make sure to buy it if you haven't and read it there where I've made it flow so nicely, where Emily has made it flow so nicely. <laughs> Our hero today though is Herman Dosenbach. And here he is with my great-grandfather, Theodore. This is Theodore with his park band uniform, and this is Herman, and I'm say 1920 circa. It is certainly pre-1924. And um, Theodore, by the way, founded the Rochester Park Band in 1904. It was the, this is something Rochester should be much proud of. It was the first municipally funded band in New York State. Municipally funding, meaning the city government took an interest in making this happen for the citizens. And it was also one of the very first in the country in 1904. And he directed it until his death in 1924. And here also is Herman. He is a confident fellow, can you tell? <laughs> he is enthusiastic and charming, and he can also be tough. And he is absolutely dedicated to bringing good classical music to Rochesterians. As you know from the description of my article, it focuses on this year of 1911-1912, during which Hermann Dosenbach and his family, his wife and three daughters, spent a full year in Europe, paid for by George Eastman and a group of culturally minded Rochesterians. Why would they do this? Well, Herman's mission was to attend as many musical events as possible, operas, symphonies, chamber music, solo violinists, etc., to soak it all up and bring back everything he knew to Rochester, where the powers that be were ramping up the musical scene. So who was this Herman Dosenbach conductor? Herman founded the Dosenbach Rochester Orchestra as a society orchestra in the 1890s and then as a formal symphony orchestra in 1900. It was a precursor to today's Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra. Herman also co-founded a music school on Prince Street, which in 1918-1919, George Eastman purchased for the U of R and which in just a few years became the Eastman School of Music. Born in 1868, Herman once described how, as a boy, he wasn't really interested in practicing the violin. That is, until his father Matthias and Rochester conductor Henri Api took him to see the great Chicago and New York City conductor Theodore Thomas, who was in town with his orchestra, performing in the old Fitzhugh Hall. Herman said of the experience of seeing Theodore Thomas, quote, then and there, I knew what I wanted to do. Now, he's probably about 10 years old at this time, I'm going to guess. Then and there, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to conduct a symphony orchestra. And he immediately and over the years began to pave his way. He said, I saw well enough that to do what I wanted to, I must go at my violin in earnest. And thereafter, there was no complaint about my practice. I put in hours every day. I played in Api's Philharmonic Orchestra. I played in theater orchestras, for I knew I must learn the routine. I was for a time in the orchestra at the casino, where we used to give some of the good light operas and play good music. I also went for a time to play in the McKechnie Theater at Canandaigua for additional practice. Herman was already driven. At 17 years of age in 1885, 
Herman was performing with his older brother Adolf, and by 1891, he had formed a chamber quartet and a small orchestra, which was largely a society orchestra. And, you know, that just means that you have a classical mix of music, but you have popular songs too. You might play for dancing, you know, all, you know all, it's for entertainment. Well, music is always entertainment, isn't it? Um, from about 1888 to 1892, Herman taught at Ingham University in L nearby Leroy, New York. How many people here have heard of Ingham University? I see Jeff in the back. Anybody else? I always ask this at a talk, and I always get basically the same thing. Um, somebody needs to write a Rochester history about Ingham University. I thought I was going to do it, and I've researched them a lot, but their full story goes well beyond my part that I want to know. So someone else who's going to do all that needs to do it. Ingham was the first women's college in the state of New York. Ingham was the first chartered women's university in the country, the first in the nation to confer academic degrees upon women um, before Wells College um, and others. And Ingham lived for about four or five decades, and in the 1890s it was founded by two sisters, and after they passed away, somehow things, the, the financing just uh, fell apart, and Ingham closed in the 1890s. Very, very important, though. Um, in the 1890s, the Dosenbach Orchestra grew in numbers and popularity and performed everywhere in Rochester and in nearby towns for events large and small, weddings, balls, charity donations, graduations, chamber of commerce meetings, holiday events, you name it. The um, leap year card parties, the after Easter dances, all kinds of events. It, it's truly a history of the way people lived at that time and what they did. Um, hey, wh how would you like to go shopping at your favorite department store downtown when they were here? How would you like to go shopping at your favorite department store with an orchestra serenading you from the balcony? <laughs> That's how it was done then. So during the spring and fall pushes and new merchandise coming out, the Dosenbach Orchestra performed for the shoppers at Sibley, Lindsay and Kerr, McCurdy and Norwells, Garson's, H.B. Graves, Beadle and Sherburn Company, Scranton and Wetmore, and others. Herman once described his early years when he was trying to establish himself in the musical world as a conductor, saying how he, quote, formed acquaintances that enabled him to make a beginning at conducting. Well, I would not describe Herman as a modest man. However, this is an understatement. Herman was adept at garnering the patronage of the famous, wealthy, or music-minded. His earliest patrons were the Wadsworths of Geneseo, playing occasionally throughout the hunting season and at least once and maybe more for the annual hunt ball. Also, Herman taught Susan B. Anthony's niece. There are two letters in the U of R about that, and this one is where Susan B. is inviting him to her house um, for some kind of a get-together. Another important benefactor was Emily Sibley Watson, who established the Memorial Art Gallery in the memory of her son, J.G. Averill, who had died in 1904 of typhoid. Herman Dosenbach was J.G.'s friend and violin teacher, and that is Herman, and that is J.G. on the steps of their now gone home on Prince Street and their garden, which was quite a thing, I guess. But finally, and of course, Herman's greatest patron would be George Eastman, the Kodak King of Rochester. In the year 1900, Herman Dosenbach's orchestra made their formal debut as a symphony orchestra in the Powers Building. It was a lavish event with patronesses such as Mrs. Watson, Mrs. Sibley, Mrs. Cunningham, Mrs. Lindsay, listen to these names, we all know these names, Mrs. Mulligan, Mrs. Gorsline, and last but never, never least, Mrs. G.W. Eastman, George's mother. For the next 19 years, Herman's orchestra would continue to grow and successfully perform in various venues in the city. In 1905, George Eastman hired Herman's quartet and his quintet to perform twice weekly at his East Avenue mansion and for his big parties, such as his 1914 uh, New Year's Eve party, which is quite a story on that one. 
And so they played for the next 14 years. When you visit the mansion, you'll hear about the Kilbourne Quartet playing there. They came afterwards. They only played for 13 years. <laughs> My guys played for 14 years. Anyways, um, and so with that, we have just about arrived to the year 1911. In the article, I give a pretty detailed roundup of the specific meetings and conversations which led to and resulted to the decision to send Herman and family to Europe. It involves University of Rochester President Rush Reese, who comes across to me, by the way, as a pretty nice guy, a decent guy, a stand-up guy. And so that's in the article, of course, right back there, or some of you have it, I see. But here's one fun fact. I just love this. So these were logos from 1910 that the Chamber of Commerce used for their 22nd annual dinner. And you get a sense of what the city was doing to bring city pride and to get a sense of Rochester as a growing thing and to be, have the citizens involved. Do it for Rochester. And then Rochester musician and teacher George Barlow Penny varied it and put it in his oratorial chorus program, The Creation, and said, do it for musical Rochester. So that's 1910. These things are in the air. There's a thing in the air that we are growing. Um, I'd like, actually, before I get into the trip, I'd like to introduce you to some of our main characters. And as I do that, I first want to give a shout out to Polly Smith. Hi, Polly. Um, Polly Smith is a Dosenbach descendant who lives out near Chicago. Um, and I got in touch with her via the internet. And um, I offer to you this research advice. I offer it to you strongly for family historians. Find other descendants who came from your ancestors. Polly is the great granddaughter to Herman. I'm the great granddaughter to Theodore, the two brothers. Um, I visited Polly and Polly has been very, very generous in sharing photos with me and you'll see that you're going to see her courtesy Polly Smith at the bottom of many of these photos. And here's the thing, when you are able to get in touch with other descendants, they might have stuff you're not going to find in the archives or you're unlikely to find in the archives. They might have personal family photos and that's where you can really get to know your people. So let's meet some of our people here. I told you he was fun, right? Can you see Herman? Hello. There he is. That's Herman Dosenbach. This is a photo I also found in the U of R. I do not know what this event is. I can make one guess, but it's such a total guess that I really wouldn't even bother or where it is. Um, but I really like this photo because look at Herman clowning around. Um, let's see another one. Here's another one. I also don't know where this is, although it's I don't know. I, I could try to guess, but I don't know where this is. I believe I can identify some of these people, like this one and this one, but I haven't done it yet. But there's Herman. He was fun. It communicates through all of the photos that Herman was fun. He had fun, and he was also, um, he worked the room, I'm going to say. I think Herman always worked the room. This is Daisy Dosenbach, a younger picture and one from the 20s. These are Daisy's pearls that you see in this photo. Something just fell. I don't know what that was. I'll tell you about that later. Daisy's here today. Thank you to Alma. This, these are Herman and the three daughters. Of course, they're older here. There's Herman. These are three daughters. This is, I say, uh, early 1920s. This has to be before 1924. And this is Hazel and Elsa, uh, Alma. And I believe this person is Elsa, and we're going to be talking about her in a little bit. But I like to show you these photos because I think these are the kinds of things that make people come alive. And here is Herman and Daisy Dosenbach, oh, maybe the 30s. I'm just, uh, that's just a guess. And I believe they're on the porch of their summer home at the, in the Forest Lawn community in Webster, New York, which... Um, really uh, makes a big appearance in the article, but especially in the online diary, the summer community at Florence Law. And so if you have interest in that, ask me some more. Um, okay, so these are our people. 
So let's go up to July of 1911. There's been these meetings. Rush Reese is involved. Uh, the city would like to ramp up the musical scene. Let's send Herman to Europe. Herman's going to see as many musical performances as possible. He's going to see the great conductors, the great orchestras, and he's going to come back ready for us to ramp everything up. So there were events at which friends and colleagues said their goodbyes to Herman. This is one of them. Notice this. This is the last Sunday. Uh, Herman's quartet or quintet played every Sunday at the Lake Avenue Baptist Church for years and years and years. Um, so this is the last Sunday that Dosi will be with us for a whole year. And we want you to be present and help us give him a rousing send-off. I don't call him Dosi. Um, and then on July 26, the family went to Rochester's New York Central Train Station to board the 913 train. And they arrived in New York City at 5.50 p.m. Now, this train station is in 1883, the New York Central Railroad Station was moved from the west side of the Genesee River to the east side between St. Paul and Clinton. It was replaced in 1914, just three years after this, by the new Claude Bragdon Design Station, which of course was torn down in 1965. We talk often of the Claude Bragdon Station, and it's beautiful, so as well we should, but look at this beauty. I mean, that's really, really something. So I told you, and I, don't, I wonder if you heard these details. They, um, the family boarded the 9.13 a.m. train. They arrived in New York City at 5.50 p.m. where they were met by Uncle A, A period. Now you should be doing a Those don't sound like the kind of details you find in newspapers. Those are personal details. And so now I get to the diary. It's a, Uncle A is a rather personal nickname. Where did I get that information? So to remind you again about finding descendants of your ancestors. A few years into my research, I found Alma Farrow. Her son, Glenn, was commenting on Dosenbach photos on Ancestry.com. And so we connected, and he connected me with his mother, Alma, who is the granddaughter of Herman Dosenbach. Alma lives in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, and we have met on a few occasions and kept in touch, and well, we're family now. And let me digress to say that this talk today is dedicated to three people. Alma is one of them. Also, Robert Farrow, Alma's lovely husband, who was once a musician himself and who once auditioned with Herman Dosenbach to be in the Rochester Park Band. And so Robert was able to evoke for me an aspect of Herman's personality, which was, he may have been charming, but he could be tough. Robert did not make it into the Rochester Park Band despite his connection with Herman's daughter, Alma. But he was a good violinist. And also, today's talk is dedicated to Glenn, Alma's son, who brought us together. Sadly, both Robert and Glenn have passed. And though I only knew them briefly, I miss them and I thank them. And I want to send love and kisses to Alma out there watching in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, a most pretty town. So consider this. The Dosenbachs lived in their time periods and then they all passed. We are living in our time periods and we will, of course, all pass, some sooner, some later. If you care to communicate with your descendants down the line, leave them information, messages, words, leave them behind. So anyways, it turns out that Alma's mother, Elsa, Herman's daughter, who was 15 years old when she and her sisters and parents embarked on their trip to Europe, left words behind for us. Elsa kept a diary. And in 2021, when Alma was downsizing, she discovered this diary, did not know it existed. And she wanted to give it to me. And I have it right here. This is the diary, which I presume is going to be housed perhaps in the local history department, I hope. Um, and, and so I went to Alma's house, and we've got the diary. And we sat in, at Alma's house, and I read the diary to her um, all afternoon. There were tears. There were giggles. It was quite an experience. I actually got a little shiver here. This is the nature of family history research. This is the joy of it. Um, in RIT, 
as a second, I guess a second part or something having to do with this article is going to be putting this diary online. So look for that, I, I think early next year, we'll see. Um, and they'll have a picture of the diary page and a transcription and things that you can click on to get more information or annotations. It should be really fun. I learned a lot from this diary. So that's how I know that Uncle A picked them up, and Uncle A was Adolf Dosenbach, as you see in this picture, who was living in New York City at that time. He picked them up at the train station and spent a few days with them in New York City seeing the sights. So that's a family story tucked into a larger public story. Adolf was the older brother to Herman, the younger brother to Otto. He was an accomplished violinist who performed as a child with his brother Otto. Adolf was a teacher of violin at Ingham University. He was also, a, a, for a short time, a leader of the Genesee Falls Band, and Adolf was the music director of the Lyceum Theater for about 15 years. By 1911, Adolf lived part-time in Rochester and part-time in New York City, where his musical interests seemed to have gotten taken over by chess. He played chess all the time. Those are the articles I had to find too, thousands, chess. He submitted chess problems to the New York Clipper. So the Dostenbachs get to New York City. They stay at the Grand Union Hotel. Um, and so I'm going to move a little quicker here, but there's reference in the diary to all these places that they stay. And then when you go and learn about these places, it's amazing. Many of them are gone. Many have their own stories. Um, the Grand Union Hotel is gone, but it was just steps from the Grand Central Depot. Um, and the Dosenbachs were lucky to have stayed there in 1911 because by 1916, the hotel had been demolished and the Pershing Square building exists there today. They crossed the Brooklyn Bridge. They visited the new New York Public Library. A visit to the New York, oh, I have her, there's Alma. There we go. There we go. A visit to the New York Public Library in July of 1911 was indeed quite special, as it had recently been built and was officially dedicated only two months earlier with a circulation of one million books already in place. The Dosenbachs went to the Battery Park and Aquarium. There's the aquarium. Where they, this is so fascinating to me, they quote, watched immigrants land. Now these were, Herman is the son of an immigrant. These are, to my mind, close to the immigrant experience, but for them, it's an American experience. They watch immigrants land, they go to Wanamaker's and Hyler's Chocolates, and then they, this is another interesting one, they, quote, had supper at a German restaurant, just to get used to it, you know. Those are Elsa's words, which tells me a lot. It means they really weren't employing German traditions in their daily life in Rochester because Elsa is not clear as to what German food is going to taste like. Um, so they went, they, they rode up and down Riverside Drive. They saw the Pennsylvania Railroad Station designed by McKim, Mead, and White. Um, and it had just been completed in 1910. So they saw that a year after it had the largest indoor space in New York City and must have looked majestic with its stone, glass, and sculptured interior. And I tell you that so you're, you're imagining being there. They saw something called the Eden Museum, which went bankrupt just a few years later. The Bronx Park and Zoo they went to. Uh, Elsa was thrilled about that. And I'm going to tell you the Dosenbachs loved zoos because over the course of their diary, they visit four different zoos at five different times within just a little more than their first month of being there. And then finally, the Dosenbachs left New York City where they went to Hoboken. And would you think I could find a picture in Hoboken of the ships docking? There it is. And that was, the, that was the port for the Hamburg American Line, which they were taking, where they boarded the ship, the President Lincoln, and left on July 29. The, uh, the USS President Lincoln of the Hamburg American Line, of course, for them, it's a, um, a domestic, a recreation carrier. It was built in 1907, however. It was seized by the United States Navy in 1917 and used as a troop transport. On May 31, 1918, it was struck by torpedoes and sank, along with 26 of the 715 men on board. But let's, let's stay in 1911, when there's a lot of happy people on board this ship going to Europe. 
Let's see them. There's the Dosenbach family on board the ship. It's not a flattering photo, I know, <laughs> but it's the one that we've got. And I don't quite understand what's going on. I feel like they're dressed up because they're in such different kinds of, I mean, this is very 1890s. This is not a 1911 thing to wear here. Um, so, you know, um, I think they're dressed up for something. But there's Herman, Daisy, pretty sure that's Hazel. I think that's Alma, and I just can't say, I don't know who that is. So our, our Elsa is probably not in this photo. Though, you know, identifying photos is, is not easy. And here they also are on board the ship. This is um, Herman. He's in the back here. He's a little hidden, unusual for him. With friends that he met on board the ship, and the reason we know about this is he received a postcard from a Leonardo Fortuno from Buenos Aires. And it's a postcard, and it actually has these little pictures on the side. And with our wonderful technology, I can blow them up, and they work. And here's one more. You know that's our guy right there, huh? Right in the middle, the boss. We'll just call him the boss. And these are men that he met and must have had a good time on board the ship, the President Lincoln. They um, traveled across the ocean. Elsa got a little bit seasick. It was about a week, week and a half, something like that. And then they passed the White Cliffs of Dover. This is a modern photo, but it surely must have looked the same. The cliff face is 350 feet high and stretches for eight miles. I can see them just with their jaw hanging, watching this and the feeling of excitement. Their ship took them to Cuxhaven, up around the bend, which is... Um, it's, a, it's the Hamburg American port on the shores of the North Sea and at the mouth of the Elba River. From there, they took a train to Hamburg, where they stayed a few days. And then from there, they went to Berlin, where they lived throughout the rest of Elsa's diary. But in fact, towards the end of the year, they left Berlin and toured much of Europe, ending in London, where they saw the Ballet Russe perform. Oh, I want to be there. And then they went back home a year later. So Elsa's diary goes on to tell us many of the places they saw in Hamburg and in Berlin. And much of that is related in the article, and much more of it will be in the online diary. So I'm going to leave that for you to get more of it there. I do have a little bit coming up, though. I just want to talk a bit more about Elsa's diary, which is precious and informative. And it's proof that the personal materials we find in family article archives, we call them stuff. I got stuff up there in the attic, or I got that room with stuff, or under my bed. It's more than personal or familial. It's, it's about a time and a place, and it fills in our public history. Elsa's diary is a teenage diary, even if that word wasn't used then or that concept. Still, it reflects the humor and interests of a 15 to 16-year-old girl, fashion, friends. Elsa yearns every day for letters from her friends, many visits to the post office, especially those from the forest lawn community. And much of that, well, that's really fun. That'll be in the diary. Elsa gives a gr also gives a great deal of information about where they went and also great deal of information on the various musical events they attended. Her info dovetails with Herman's interviews and letters, and the story unfolds nicely. But I want to go over a couple of her entries because I love them. So I'm going to read you this one. Um, we're all human, right? We're all human. We tell lies sometimes. Or, or maybe we don't open up with all of our truth, especially to our doctor. Um, and they were human, too. So on 918, Elsa writes, came home from school and found mother sick. The doctor says it's heart trouble. And then the next day, doctor was here and wanted to know if mother smoked or drank. As she didn't, he said it was the coffee. Now you already know from what I told you that Daisy being sick would be of great concern to the family, I'm sure. However, there is circumstantial evidence that just between us, Daisy smoked. <laughs> Daisy smoked and this tells us a lot. Some of these word, verbiage, verbiage you get are doors and windows into, into understandings. Um, Daisy must, must have hid it from her daughter because her daughter doesn't seem to know anything about it. Anyways, sorry, Daisy, um, but we're all human beings. And it's those 
entries that I love because I want to see how we're human beings. But let's talk about hats, shall we? Hats are very important throughout this diary. On 918, uh, Elsa writes, went to school this morning and then practiced so I could go downtown. I got a new coat. It's a beauty, brown with different brown trimming. Went downtown in the afternoon and I got a hat, a white felt hat with a weenie black velvet bow on it. Love it. And then uh, about a week or so later, she writes, after dinner, mother and Hazel went downtown. Hazel got a hat and it's really good looking, but you have to look at it a while to get used to it. Now I'm going to move ahead. I'm going to read a couple more quotes on the hats, but you want to know what she's talking about? Have you seen 1911 hats? Boom. This was the year for hats. She then describes this. Mother and Hazel came home from a walk and mother had on the most peculiar hat I've seen in a long time. One of those high affairs with a wing on each side. She changed the wings and now it looks good. <laughs> also, Hazel, uh, I'm sorry, Elsa writes about this. this. This will give you a sense of their tourist experience. We went to the post office afterwards, but didn't get any mail. After we roamed around Lust Park for a while, we started to go and we met Mother and Alma. The postal card sellers seem to think we're easy marks because they bother the life out of you. Hazel tried to be polite to one and he followed her all over the park almost. She sees a group of boys and then she just says, lemons. <laughs> and all this kind of stuff that is just wonderful and hilarious. And it's also informative though, so it has everything. Elsa gives details about what they did, where they went, how they got lost, making friends, looking for schools, finding a flat. It's experiential. It's the experience they were happening. happening. And many of the places that they visit, visited were destroyed in World War II. So that makes, the, that, that makes it even more interesting. This is the Hamburg City Hall that they visited. She mentions having coffee more than once at the Cafe Bauer. I wouldn't have thought I could find a postcard of that, but look here. Right there is the Cafe Bauer, and, it's, and this is from 1911, their year, so, although the image might be earlier. But picture them walking on the street, going along, looking all around, walking into the Cafe Bauer to have some coffee. They visited many palaces, here's one. Many more, hopefully we'll get lots of these photos onto the diary because the photos of the postcards help you to experience it, to make it come alive. I can give you the facts, they saw this, 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 and this, but what's that about? We want the experience. So anyways, they were there a year. After a year, they come home. They arrive in New York City um, at the port at the same time that their friends Montgomery Leach and Clarence Barber are arriving from another shared vacation. So they all meet together, they come home. What happened next for Herman? Upon, this is much detailed in the article, so a summary, brief summary, because we're almost done. Upon his return to Rochester, Herman's orchestra was renamed from the Dosenbach Orchestra to the Rochester Orchestra. A board of directors was created to help with management and funding. And over the next seven years, big name soloists were brought to Rochester to perform with the orchestra, including, and notice these photos are all inscribed to Herman, Carl Flesch and Clarence Whitehill, Eddie Brown, who um, Elsa describes seeing perform in um, Berlin, actually before he's come to the United States and gotten a big reputation. And she describes him as they loved him. He gave like, I, I think it was eight encores and only stopped when they shut off the lights and locked the doors. She described him as homely though. I don't think he's homely. What does it matter? Joanna Gadsky, David Bisfam, Ronald Warenrath, Alma Gluck, Mabel Garrison, Garrison, and last but never least, Josef Hoffman, Fritz Chrysler. These are some of the soloists that were able to be brought in to play with the Dosenbach Orchestra, as they, or the Rochester Orchestra, as they were trying to position it as more than a mid-city orchestra. In 1913, Herman co-founded the Dosenbach Klingenberg School on Prince Street. And of course, that's the one that George Eastman will eventually purchase for the Eastman School of Music. And there were big events in Rochester. 
that the city was involved in organizing. Here's one, the Children's Music Festival held in Genesee Valley Park at which both Rochester's Park Band and Herman's Orchestra performed. The Rochester Shakespeare Pageant at which again they, they, they both performed 2,500 characters, a chorus of 1,000 voices and a band and orchestra of 80 pieces. They had a seating price chart at which it had, I think, 1,500 seats that were free because this was the city putting this on and trying to bring people from their houses into the fresh air. It was an event for everybody. By the end of the decade, George Eastman, oh wait, let me do this before I get to there. Um, in 1924, my great-grandfather passed away at the young age of 52 from heart disease and Herman at that point was out of the music business, he thought, but he was asked to take over the park band and he did, and he directed it till his death in 1946. And here's one event that he did with the park band, that's a whole other story on its own, but to give you a sense, they played at the 1941 celebration of the rededication of the Frederick Douglass Monument, which had been over near the train station on Central Ave and now had moved to Highland Park, where it was until quite recently, where it's been moved up on the street so we can all see it more because we don't walk very much anymore. We drive. And so there it is, well placed where we can all see it. So by the end of the decade, George Eastman got the big idea to create a world class music school associated with the University of Rochester. This was, the, this was a, a, a new, a burgeoning idea in the country and with a world-class symphony orchestra and with a theater unrivaled by any other. Herman ended up not being involved in the big enterprise. And that's a story that I will tell in great detail soon, but not today. <laughs> You're gonna have to keep asking me back. Um, Herman was originally asked to conduct the silent movie theater orchestra and he said yes, and a few months later he declined. And there's been quite a bit of talk as to why he declined. It's a, it's a, I, I really am gonna lay that out very clear as a multitude of factors um, involving the situation. He would, he would work under a man who was gonna be the conductor who had never done it before and was inexperienced and arrogant. He, um, oh, there were many factors, including if you ever speak with especially um, Dr. Philip Carley, wonderful musician here in Rochester, you can really learn about how hard it would be to, do a, to conduct a movie theater orchestra where movies come and change and you only have a day or two with the scores and rehearsals, blah, blah, blah. Many things, he was not involved in it. He did stay involved in, he did care about music. He, re, he went to the concerts, he was on the civic theater, subscription list, all that. And then in 1924, he took over for his brother. Also in 1924, very tragically, Alma Dosenbach, one of the three daughters that went to Europe, uh, died in a car and trolley crash. Um, yeah, that was a tough year. Herman received many honors and tributes over the years. He, a presentation of a special conductor's desk, a guest conducting gig at Eastman Theater in 1933, a Highland Park tribute when he was still alive in 1944, and in 1947, a year after Herman passed away, there was a radio tribute on WHAM's The Rochester Hour, which began with a reminiscence of that earlier Highland Park tribute in 1944 when Herman was still alive, and it went like this. On a warm, clear night in June of 1944, over 1,100 men and women sat beneath the stars inhaling the fresh spring breath of Highland Park. They come, because of their warm personal love of one man. They come to honor Herman Dosenbach. As the aging man mounted the podium, thunderous applause rose to the sky, cries of greeting rang out, and in the warm spring breeze, even the trees seemed to wave their branches in welcome. But let's continue the chronology. I'm, I'm almost done. Let's continue the chronology because in 1958, I was born. I'm inserting myself into there. And in 1975, the miniseries Roots aired on TV. Did, did many of you watch Roots? And it provoked a national fervor for genealogy, including in myself. And my mother took me to Rundle's local history division, 
where I was a very, very shy 19-year-old, and I walked up, I've told some of you this story, and I walked up to, into the local history room and up to the librarian with, you know, and said, um, I'm doing a, how did I say it then, a genealogy of my mother's family, and can you help me? And the librarian was very busy and had many things in her hand and was straightening things out on the table, and she didn't, she didn't look at me, she just went, last name? <laughs> and I went, Dosenbach? That's how green I was. I wasn't Dosenbach, and the librarian doing this and that stopped, looked at me and went, the conductor? And I said, I think. <laughs> and, but life takes us where it does, and over the decades, um, you know, I did it here and there, but I was just living life and all that. So we had to wait till 2013 for me to come to Rochester and begin doing my thing. And I'm gonna tell you one more thing. Here's a tidbit, I'm gonna give you a tidbit. This is personal, but I've chosen to do this here today. Let's talk about DNA, shall we? My story took a turn and suddenly I was in it and not in the way I had thought. Um, but in a way I continue to think about because after all, we all have our place, our part in the ongoing drama that is life. Have confidence in your place, but um, in, oh, some years ago, I took a DNA test, as all genealogists do. I can tell you that my mother's my mother, my father's my father, my sisters and brothers are my sisters and brothers, woo-hoo. But as more people took tests, and you, when you would find DNA, DNA matches to other people, you, um, I kept noticing that some people weren't there. I wasn't matching families of different Dosenbach descendants who would casually mention they'd taken a DNA test. And I had to learn some more. And I had to wonder what's going on here. And, um, and then I went to visit Alma Farrow in Chagrin Falls, and I was going to ask them if they'd taken a DNA test. And if they had, I knew something. I knew that I was not DNA descended from the Dosenbachs. So I was standing there in front of that fireplace that you had a picture of, and one of Alma's sons quickly said to me, I'd hardly been there, so did you spit into the cup? <laughs> I lied. <laughs> I lied and said, no, no, I hadn't done it, because at that moment I knew, and my head was filled up. I will tell you, I was like, oh my God, I'm not a Dosenbach. I'm not a Dosenbach. Like, <sighs> well, anyways, I then went on to meet Polly, and by that time I'd pulled it together and told her what had happened, and Polly said, well, that doesn't matter. So the upshot is, we, have a, we might have a non-parental event, they call it, but the upshot is, is that my grandmother Adeline, Theodore Dosenbach, and his wife had um, one child named Adeline, his wife Nellie. They had one child named Adeline, and Adeline was not Theodore's biological daughter. Adeline was also not Nellie's biological daughter because there are descendants from there that I do not match. Adeline was adopted. And that's the story you don't expect to find and it's, it's a beautiful story actually. Adeline was adopted. I don't know how. At some point it's on my list to get somebody to help me with those DNA matches and I think we can, you can usually get to there anymore. There are no more adoption secrets anymore. Um, Adeline was adopted and it shook me for a while, but the few people I've told said, you're still part of the family. You're still coming from the Dosen box. Um, and so it becomes to me a very special story because we all have our part. We're all part of families. Um, so have confidence in your purpose and your part um, and leave stuff behind. Words, images, leave stuff behind because your descendants need you. And it's from this one, from the adopted line. They didn't see me coming, but here I am telling their story, and I will continue to do so, and they are my people. All right, I want to get your attention away from that. Did I forget to? Would you like to see the Dosen box? Let's see if I can make this work. It depends on the strength of the Internet. Do we have Wi-Fi here, do you know, or do you know if we're connected? Yeah. Do I do it here? Uh, sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. There is a thing there, ah, maybe if I do it this way, let's, let's do the real thing. 
There we go. There we go. So keep watching. This is 1913. There is the Rochester Park Band with Theodore Dosenbach leading. And I found this in a half an hour compilation that somebody put online. I'll do it one more time because it's so quick. Um, of a 1913 International Elks Convention in Rochester, New York, and that is the Rochester Park Band. Would you like to meet Herman Dosenbach? At the end of the compilation, there's a photo op, lots of guys hanging around, and then they all go to shake hands with each other. Watch who comes in from the left. Come on now. There we go. What? Hello, Herman Dosenbach. There he is. He looks directly into the camera. He is smiling, charming. It's like he's reaching right out from his place into the future to say, hey, I'm here. Remember me. Um, and Herman was remembered. Um, so I'll go to here. They're buried in Mount Hope Cemetery. And so these are a whole bunch of thoughts on family and public history research, especially in this day and age with the resources we have on storytelling and on being alive, because that's what we are, folks. We're alive. We're here still, and aren't we lucky? So thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the familiar faces I see out there. Um, Oh my gosh, I'm so glad to see so many of you, many people that I've met um, who have taken me for a tour. Herman lived at 261 Dartmouth Street, and I've forgotten the first names, but that lovely couple gave me a tour, which actually, that tour helped me to fill in my understanding of how Herman gave music lessons. Annabelle Martin, there on the end, was her mother was best friends with Herman's daughter, Hazel, and she helped me fill in many, many details, including the pronunciation of the name Dosenbach, and we've got a man sitting at the back who now is related to some of the Dosenbachs, and I'm going to get to talk to him, and many other people who have helped me. So um, I say thank you to everyone. They did it. I just get to write about it. Thank you. So, Lisa, are you willing to take some sure. questions? Yeah, sure. And is this working? Yeah. I'm going to ask you to use the microphone so we catch it for our people at home. Jeff? Jeff? That was top notch. Thank you. And I think it's because you have that familial fire in the belly that makes it flow so beautifully. And Thank you. I'm cur I've learned, among all the things I've learned since you, during your talk, is that you're not related DNA-wise, but we're all one big happy family, so why does it matter? I really went through a lot with that at first, to be honest. I worried that people, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you the personal thing. I worried that people would think I was a fraud. I don't know, you know, and if, if anyone else had told me it, I'd be saying the same thing as you, but when it happened to me, I, I was so tied into being a Dosenbach that it threw me, and then at some point I thought, I want to know about Adeline. Where'd they find her? How'd they get her? Who were, who were her people? But yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Anybody else with questions? I guess I said it all. I guess I told you more than you wanted to know. <laughs> Do your family history, please. And take a look at your stuff that you have around as archives. And um, see it as a reflection of a wider community consider talking to a local library and museum to donate it. Don't tell them about your room full of materials that you've never organized. Organize it. Chronological order is good. Um, and prepare it, but consider that um, it really give, brings a lot of information to other people as well. I, I've helped a good handful of people prepare their archives for donation, and we've got it donated into um, local libraries. So um, I'm very proud about that, actually. So consider that with your own family stuff. I will second that. 
Thank you all so much for joining us today. Lisa, thank you for sharing your wonderful story and, and the personal aspects, which I think really help us to better understand how this research takes place yep. and the work that you've done. So thank you all for coming and thank you for those at home. Thank you. Thank you, okay, I guess I'll just.